So we're going to talk about now the Toyota system of management, or what do we actually do to create this integrated system? Now, in physics, when we talk about work, we're talking about movement, a purposeful transfer of energy from one body to another. So in Japan, purpose is at the center of every organization, and the system of activities that evolves around it is how they create the business. And so as we're looking at that, we can start generating some questions in terms of management. How do we actually manage this purposeful work as a system? Now, as we look at that, what we start seeing is we've already established these guiding principles and daily, uh, quality mindset and sort of business architecture. And so we saw that this is about the uh, company cultural values. It's also about this idea of profound knowledge. And we also see on the other side that situational awareness and sense making are essential to understand where is this organization going. And then from this, we create a business system. Now that business system actually integrates the industry values. So this morning we saw different industries. So if we're talking about semiconductor industry, it has its own industry values. They're the industry values of distribution systems that other companies will have to deal with. There are other industry values that we have to deal with in terms of each of the companies that we have. But we also have to have some sort of business assumption. How are we going to fit our organization into that industry? And those are the critical assumptions we make in every organization. Now what I tell my students is, assumption is a very interesting word. You know I like etymologies. Well the word assume comes from three words. Ass, you, and me. And when we make an assumption, we make an ass out of you and me. And so we have to challenge those things, okay? We don't want to have assumptions made without understanding them. And from that business model, then we have cross-functional management. And every culture in the organization has its own discipline. It has its own culture. There's a marketing culture. There's an engineering culture in design. There's a different engineering culture in manufacturing. There's a different culture that we have when we're talking about a sales organization from a marketing organization. And human resources has a totally different organizational function or culture. So each of those cultures somehow has to get to blended together because we see those little microcultures happening. And each of those cultures has its own set of moral values and things that are important to it. And from this, we also see there's functional knowledge in each of those areas, which may be different than the profound knowledge of the whole organization. And finally, that is all what we mean by Gemba 2. That is this, this executive world of constructs and the logical system. Gemba 1 is a daily management system. This is about process management. It's the local cultural values. If I have a factory in Ikea in Portugal, that's a different cultural value than in Sweden, and it's certainly different than the China factory. And so we start seeing local cultural values are based on the uh, local culture people come from, the religious mores, the, the things that they, they value in life and how they think about things. And process knowledge can differ also. Because if I have a factory in China, I don't necessarily value human life the same way as I would in Sweden. But interestingly enough, China, where we think about buying cheap labor, is actually the number one country in terms of buying robots in the past year by double the closest country to it, which was Korea. So that's interesting. So the Chinese are looking at digitization, they're investing in all of these things. Why? To take the work away from their workers. That's interesting. And so what is necessary to coordinate this whole system? So we have to have some sort of collaborative planning and system. So around the purpose, what we see is there's a strategic direction setting process. That's what we call Hoshin Conray. A change management process. That's about how we integrate this in the organizational system. That's like a Kaizen Conray. And there's a daily management for how we manage the daily life. And so moving the organization and moving it forward it's not what Frederick Taylor called uh, scientific management. It's actually about scientific leadership. That we have to have a mechanism for moving the organization forward so we inform the executive about what's really happening in the Gemba so we can improve their disciplines of working. And what we start seeing is we have this integrated planning system, process management, and this can be business excellence, this can be Lean Six Sigma, and this is, if you will, business control or ISO 9000. And as we start seeing, it's the handoffs between each of those where we make most of our mistakes. 
We don't understand how to move from this leadership level to the systematic level to the daily management level. And as we move, we tend not to have a flow, we tend to make a disjoint movement in each of those directions. And as a result of that, we don't have good business interfaces across the system. So if we have improvement projects, what we want them to be is chartered by management. And those of you who've been in Six Sigma know that we, we have charters issued for business improvement projects. And those charters are actually, in, in a Japanese system, the same as a charter for a Hoshin Connery project. And I think a couple of you who have talked about your companies have done the same sort of thing. You've talked about these charters that you use, say this is how we're gonna work in this area. Now, management is obligated to improve the common cause of variation. Now, those who've had statistics say, Greg, wait a minute. Schuhart said we have to improve the special cause of variation. Yep, that's right. Special cause of variation is defined as deviations from the design system that are unexpected. Common cause variation is the design system is not performing as necessary or needed. I remember I was the head of quality at Compaq Computer and I, I came there from Hewlett Packard. I'd been recruited, I'd never been to Compaq before. And the first thing I did was I downsized the quality department from 564 people to 25. And that's because any label of quality was my responsibility. And so I added R&D Reliability Engineering Lab, even though it was a lot of fun for me, went back to R&D. I had 120 programmers programming quality systems. They go back to IT. I had every quality inspector in every factory in the world back to manufacturing. What was my job? My job was to pull together the common cause management system. And I had my, my people there, they were a combination of statisticians and so forth, and quality engineers and some, some corporate auditors and some communication specialists. And I had a first offsite meeting and I said, you know, our job as corporate quality is to eliminate unnecessary causes of common cause variation. One of the most embarrassing moments in my life was that was my first sentence out formally to my group and one of my statisticians raised up her hand and said, Mr. Watson, you're wrong. I said, oh crap. I said, okay, I still remember her name, Denise Myers. Uh, and I say this with fun. I said, okay, Denise, what's the matter with that? We were taught in school, we have to eliminate special cause variation. I said, yeah, I know you were taught that in school. Okay, but you know, if we eliminate special cause variation, am I gonna ask Rod Canyon, the founder of the company, to fix all the common cause variation by himself? Aren't we called corporate quality? And there's a reason for that, is that it's our job to fix the common cause variation systems. And if you think about that, if you're in that quality function at the top of the organization, what that means is you have to re-engineer the business for the future. That's not fixing all the day-to-day -day systems. Yeah, we have to teach the people to do that themselves. But we have to create the business of the future. So management is obligated to improve this system. And that means that they have to give good performance goals. They have to be able to measure the performance and say that we actually are doing the right thing. Give people the training and the methodology and delegate to them the decision rights to keep it under control. So we don't have to make all of those little decisions. They've already got the system, the common cause system we had and what we thought it's gonna do and they should manage within those boundaries. We shouldn't have to review that work. That should be Hanse, the self-review system by the management to keep the special cause variation from inflicting problems on the daily management system. So as we start looking at this, what we start seeing is Hosh and Conry is up here. It's like the business excellence function. Kaizen and Conry is here. We can define this as Lean Six Sigma, but we have to put the first step recognize which is the link from strategy. What is the resource improvement project we have to have? And then we go through define, measure, analyze, improve, control, and then we have to integrate and standardize it and put it into the daily management system. So many of the people who talk about Lean Six Sigma only talk about DMAIC. The front end of that is choosing the right projects. We don't have so many projects we can do as an organization. And the back end of that is integrating this and then putting it into the standardization system. Because if we don't purposely do that, what will happen? It won't happen. We have to actually have a mechanism for doing that. And if we start taking a look at these things, these components here, those are all part of the Japanese system for how they're gonna manage business. 
1993, I wrote a, a book. Actually, it was an interesting year for me. I told, was told I had three months to live. And I found out what I'll do if I'm told I have three months to live. I wrote my best book ever. Sold 100,000 copies. It got Library Journal Book of the, the Year for in, Engineering, Fortune Book of the Month Club. It's called Strategic Benchmarking. And in that book, one of the things they said is, people benchmark at the operational level. It's more important to benchmark at the strategic level. And up until that point in time, all benchmarking that had ever been done was done of operations. It wasn't done about how do we make better decisions for the business? How do we integrate resources across the organization? How do we choose future directions? How do we do strategic planning? And those are all things that will have just as much effect as understanding what is the best process for distributing products or routing trucks. So as we start taking a look at this, in Japan, the purpose of business is to become dantotsu. Dantotsu is the best of the best. And Dr. Kano calls this attractive quality. Attractive quality is fit for love. It's achiko. And actually, it means love at first sight. And what we start taking a look is what we start seeing is that's actually this wonderful direction. If you ever hear Kano talk about his theory of attractive quality, he talks about these two girls and uh, this girl, excuse me, <laughs> no, he talks about a girl and a boy and how <laughs> Kano would die if he heard me say that. And he talks about how he saw her the first time he wasn't interested. You know, they were just two years old and they played all the time, nothing interested. 20 years later, he sees her. She's the most beautiful girl in the world love at first sight, and he just falls in love, and they fall in love with each other, they get married. That's attractive quality. 20 years later, he's now still with her, they're married, but now they've moved down the line. It's no longer sort of attractive quality. He sees the part that she plays in her life, and she's a necessary ingredient. 20 years later, they move down to must be quality. He can't imagine life without her, and sometimes he can't like life with her. <laughs> so it's like this is transition that you're going in. So I, I, I can't talk about my marriage right now. Anyhow, so <laughs> oh, my wife isn't here and, and Selena's left. So how does management create <laughs> just different ways? Well, what we start seeing is that management decisions are actually ruled by some things. Herbert Simon in 1947 wrote a book called Administrative Behavior. That was the beginning of what we call behavioral economics. He won the Nobel Prize for it. He also created the term artificial intelligence and, and, and many of those types of issues and, and created some principles of organization strategies, probably one of the, the most modern, best modern thinkers in management. But he said that actually there's, there's sort of three things that are happening in an organization's management decision process or decision making. First, the quality of the decision depends on the ability of the manager to make decisions. Do they have competence in the subject matter? Have you ever seen a marketing person make a decision about an R&D problem? I have, and it was wrong. And it was really wrong. But he felt good because he could do this technology decision because he was sitting at the head of the table. And everybody around the organization was cringing. And then the, so the, the, the software guy decided to speak up. He says, you know, you've never given us requirements. And he says, yeah, we wrote those requirements all the time. He turns to the mechanical engineering lead, and he says, when were your requirements done? Our requirements were done two months ago. See, I told you. He said, no, that's about how you're going to design the thing. How are people going to use it? That's a software requirement. You know, in, in, in Toyota, a software requirement or any requirement has three conditions. Condition number one, I fill in the role. Who? What is it that the person is? Are they a user? Are they going to be a customer? Is it a buyer? And then want a function. And the function is a noun verb phrase. It's not just a static thing. It's what I want to be done and how I want it to operate. The third component is for this business reason. And what Toyota told me is if you don't have all three, you don't have a requirement. That's an interesting challenge to put down for all of the things we call requirements in our organization because they don't fly for Toyota. So we can see that there can be some problematic decisions that we make in organizations. And we can get this uneven waste, the three different types of waste happening in the organization. So Muri can cause Muda, which creates Muda, which workers are unable to, to eliminate. Now here's an example of this. AT&T, 
and, and I could use lots of different companies, but this is one I, I'm kind of familiar with because I was working with them in 1984 at Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard gave uh, AT&T their first commercial contract after divestiture. And, and HP ended up getting the majority sales opportunities for computers in Mexico because we put that into the contract, that they gave away all their Mexican manufacturing credit so HP could sell computers in Mexico. And it was the only country in the world where HP outsold IBM at that time. And so they, they were going commercial, and so they decided that they wanted to become a computer company. So they were investing on average 200 million a year uh, back around 1987. 1991, they decided that wasn't very successful, so let's buy NCR, which is a computer company. So they bought it for 7.4 billion. Uh, they lost uh, another two, bi uh, two billion, and then they sold it for 3.4 billion just five years later. And then they, they, in 1994, they decided that they would buy McGraw Cellular because the cellular business is so good. So they bought it for $11.6 billion, spent $15 billion, sold it in 2000 uh, for $10 billion. Is this, is this good math? And then uh, they decided that they could actually get out and re recreate the Bell Systems. So they bought uh, TCI and Media One for 112 billion. You can't, you know, spend little efficiently, spend more inefficiently. And then they, they created the largest cable operator, which they sold to Comcast for 72 billion. Now, in 15 years, they lost or wasted over 50 billion, and they lost more in operating expenses. That's an example of misplaced capitalism, or Mori creates Mora creates Muda, and you lost your shirt. And it's still considered a blue chip stock. So if you don't think executives can't make a whole bunch of mistakes, they can. So the Toyota system. So Toyota system says insufficient standardization and rationalization create waste, Muda. Inconsistency, Mora, and unreasonableness, Mori, in work procedures. And <clears throat> work hours that will eventually lead to a problem of production of defective products. So Taiichi Ono linked the three together in a system. He also talked about there's two different types of gembus. And so what we start seeing is, this is a little words here, but they actually have two different systems in Toyota for managing. So out of that 1963 process, they said, we have to have two systems. Quality management, which is to eliminate waste, and cost management, which is to eliminate cost. Now it's interesting, because you go in the factory and there's only one performance measure in the factory. It's not quality, it's not cost, it's time. Because time is the proxy measure of quality and cost. If something's taking too long, it's because it's a quality problem. And if it's taking too long, it's costing too much. So I only actually have to measure time to have an efficient measurement system in a production operation, and I have to understand what are the derivatives, the process derivative that takes me back to the root cause, quality, and then the impact derivative in that in terms of the cost that's delivered. So those are the two systems that are actually operating in the Toyota management system. They're operating in parallel at the upper level of the organization, but when you get into the daily management system, it becomes one and the same. But you don't see the elements of them being separate because that's all happening in IT systems. That's the invisible factory. And when I was talking with uh, Sakakuchi-san about the quality management system, he says, it's not the visible factory that's most important, it's the invisible one. And the invisible factory is the one that's creating that network of relationships among the business measures that, that got, get pulled up to the next level. That's the role of the industrial engineers. The industrial engineers will take, if there's a system problem on the production line, it's the industrial engineer who's the problem solver, it's not the team. The industrial engineers in Toyota are trained with five weeks of training, which is the equivalent of a black belt but they probably get better statistical training than you do. Everybody in Toyota is trained in statistics. There's lots of statements by uh, oh, Jeffrey Liker, uh, Shingo, and so forth. Don't do statistics. Shingo says don't do SQC, SPC. Okay, but take a look. I would say don't do it either. 
I'm going to tell you control charts, X bar R charts, X bar X charts are obsolete and have been since 1993. Now, the quality community hasn't been smart enough to figure that out because we can actually do individuals charts. That's when they were created by a guy named Cuisenberry. But the problem with individuals charts is all the tests are not designed for individuals charts because what I see on the individual chart is the raw data distribution. And for time distribution, it's never normal. It's always got a long tail because it's a Poisson distribution or more accurately, it's an Erlang distribution if you must. You know, but it's a long tail distribution because you want to minimize time and that means good is small, it's not at the nominal bit. So what does this mean? It means that we have to revisit the methods that we are gonna use in the future because many of the rules are tied to an obsolete system of thinking. Just like failure mode effects analysis. I don't do that and I haven't done it for 20 years. And I don't recommend that and I don't teach it to black belts because there's much better ways to do things. As you start taking a look at these things, we have to critically challenge all of those tools that have been passed down from 80 years ago, or 50 years ago, or even 30 years ago. Not one of the quality gurus that you would name, including Feigenbaum, Duran, Deming, Crosby, Ishikawa, used a personal computer. Excuse me? They all did the calculations by hand, and you should too. No. Not really. So what does that mean? That means that the quality created by our grandfathers is now obsolete. Hmm. That's actually the title of the speech I'm giving next week in Berlin. Then I say long live quality. Because we can actually fix all of that stuff pretty easily. It's a dedicated system to rethink it. I can come up with a generic pattern for any distribution based on the empirical rule and putting together Boolean logic and recreate those Western electric rules from 1950, and then I have the solution. But I have too many things to do, too many speeches to give. So I have a list of 12 of those things. If anybody's looking for thesis topics, I have 12. You know, I want to get them done fast. Here's an advisor, Pedro, uh, Paolo when he comes in. You know, uh, we, we have a whole bunch of people here who could you know, teach you on those things. You get very popular, you can name a tool after yourself, don't call it after me, I don't care. Anyhow, so these are things we have to go change and, and, and re-effect. So what actually happens is policy is what runs Toyota. Now this is an interesting word. It was created in 1964 when Duran created his book. It was called Breakthrough Management. He gave the first lecture in 1964 in Japan. They didn't understand what he was talking about. They said, what's this thing called policy? So Duran defined it. Now policy in Japan does not mean what it means in a Western mind. In a Western mind, it's what I call round words. It's, we're going to treat all people equal. We'll put the customer first. Nah, that's not what it means in Japan. So they have what they call fundamental policy, long-range planning. I've sort of given the idea what long-range planning means. So if you're going to buy land in America for Toyota, you're buying it 25 years ahead of time before you put a factory there. Long-range planning. It's not five years. Hardly anything is five years. Model changeovers are five years. You know, there's an awful lot of long-range consideration. So that's long, fundamental policy, long-range plans, and then they have long-range goals, long-term policy, and then that becomes what we call annual policy. So the annual policy is a slogan. I still remember with Canon, their, their slogan the first year I became Vice President of Quality Xerox was kill Xerox. So I returned the favor and I said the annual quality slogan for this year for Xerox is kill Canon. <laughs> Anyhow, so this is the annual piece and then when that rolls into the organization, excuse me, when it rolls into the organization, it goes into the functions. And there's 19 different functions. And when we talk about the Toyota production system, it's just in the production function. Everything else is cross-functional. So the functions are designed into operating departments that perform the work, and a factory is an operating department. So all of the functions are integrated there as a cross-functional management team. Now, when we talk about this idea of policy, what it actually means in Japan is it is a system for aligning everybody towards the same goals. It's the uh, direction to make sense, and employees are motivated to participate. 
It's the policy development requires the engagement of the whole organization. It's going to be measured quality, cost, time, and breakthrough. Policy performance targets are for the enterprise, not for a single person. And performance targets have to be analyzed. They're not set arbitrarily. And we start taking a look at this, you know, how does management engage workers in this? The word came out earlier, catch ball. Okay. And so this whole system, policy, is actually what we call a strategic plan. It's not round sounding words that come out of human resources. So as we're looking at this, that policy came up from the top, long range policy. And that means it's setting the overall direction for how performance is going to be achieved. So here I am. And uh, this here is, uh, well, Ken Takatori is from Juice, me, uh, myself. And this is uh, Toshido Horikiri. He is the founding president of Toyota Engineering Corporation. So I'm going to go back to the 2015 meeting I had with Sorichito Toyota. And I asked him the question, don't you care about all of these executives or consultants talking about the quality systems and, and stuff and not really saying what Toyota does? And his answer was really interesting. He said, we make cars. No, I don't care. That's their job. We make cars. And I said, well, don't you care that it's cheapening the brand of Toyota? Because when people can't do what the Toyota system is supposed to be doing, people say, oh, Toyota's not so good after all. And he goes, fine! He says, I will dedicate my life. He's 92 years old. I will dedicate my life to correcting this. And the next month he created Toyota Engineering Corporation. This is the former chief engineer of the uh, Prius. This is the former uh, quality manager of the Nagoya plant, the mother plant. And this cute girl here is Katya, who works with Celine and I. And she got the, 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 the thrill of a lifetime by being able to go, and we talked about the Toyota management system. And so what happened in this was uh, Takahiro san and I had both given he gave the first speech on the Toyota management system in Sochi, Russia on April 7th. And then I gave a speech to interpret how quality management systems were embedded in the Toyota system. And so this is what I'm going to talk about a little bit here. After that, he invited me to come back. And he said, I talked to my friend Sasaki-san. He said, you might have some good words. So this is the afternoon that we spent uh, together uh, just this last September. And what he said was, the Toyota management system is this. There's a Toyota design system, which spins into the Toyota production system, which spins into the Toyota sales system that gives feedback to the Toyota design system, and it continues to spin. And so if you talk about the Toyota production system, it's not what they put into design, it's not what they put into sales, and it certainly is not what they put into management. Now, a lot of people have said, oh, we have to go do 5S in the office. Would you be surprised to hear they don't do 5S in the office in Toyota? Why? Well, it came about that there was a British guy in the Small Peace Trust who talked about 5S in administration, and he's the guy who talked about it. Now, what we see is there's these three systems going. This is the deliverable engine. The content is coming out of design. The operational engine is the production system, and the sales system is the financial engine driving Toyota. So each of those is contributing to the system that runs the whole organization. And each of them has their part to do, and you have to understand each of the parts individually to be able to put that system together. So I look at this and I say, okay, well, what we have are functions. Functions are operating processes. Those processes have measures, and we can analyze them. Now, if we think about improving things, there's really two ways we can improve something. One is by improving the quality of the deliverable, or we can then improve the process by which the deliverable is produced. And so going back to Japanese style thinking, I said, well, if I take a look at this, this world quality characteristic. Now, this is a quote here that came from Walter Schuhart, 1931, in Appendix A to his book. And what he says, it's necessary for us to think of uh, a quality characteristic in the same sense that Whitehead talked about an actual entity and process in reality. And as far as I can tell, nobody's ever written a paper on that because it's actually very important. 
An actual entity is the thing we do. In German, they call it Ding an sich. Okay. And if I'm talking about Toyota, what I'm talking about is this is improving a product that's delivered through a process. So we have lots of actual entities, lots of products in Toyota. Okay. Each one of those is going through a process. We have a design process, then we have a production process. On the Toyota production line, you can build any car within a certain frame size on the production line. Okay, so I want flexibility to be able to build all of those, and that's about critical to quality characteristics. I'm gonna have many quality products going through that process. Similarly, if I talk about the actual activity, the thing we're doing in any one process, I can create a streamlined process for that one stage, but then I have many stages in the production process. So as I look at these two together, I say, okay, what I have to do is I have to find a way to work smarter. And in the Toyota system, what they want to be able to do is build total flexibility in the system. That's the agility. And yet at the same time, it has to flow and it has to have the work discipline. So what we start seeing is then this whole system, Dr. Kano said, he says, processes require an improvement emphasis that is uh, uh, parallel to uh, that for given products. I gave a speech right after I was uh, at Toyota in Tokyo, and, and Kano said this at that thing because I made the comment that Kano's model is for products, it's not for processes. And that's a problem, because products are created in processes. And we have to have the equivalent model for the process flow. So if I talk about R&D, I just have to understand what the customer wants, then I take it through a development process and then I make a promise. This is what I'm gonna give you. And then at the end, here's what I gave you. And as we go through there, if I don't promise you what you wanted, that's a design error. If I make a promise and I don't deliver it, that's not a design error anymore, that's an operational error. And we have different systems, Demaic and Demadvi, working on each of those two to improve what we're doing. Excuse me, Demadvi is the, uh, acronym for Design for Six Sigma. So what we look at is we have to have both of those working together at once. We have to understand the quality of the product, like with the Kano model, and we have to understand the process by which it's gonna flow through. And so one is about critical to quality things in the product, and critical to satisfaction is gonna be delivered through the process that consistently delivers the outcome to customers. Now if we take a look back in time, we start seeing, okay, we have different things. And what I see is this comment about quality strategy. And executives say, that's not part of my work. But what I want is them to see is quality as a strategy. And that's very different than quality strategy. And in their mindset, they think, because we've been talking to them about ISO 9000, ISO 14000, whatever. They think that's quality strategy. And they don't understand, we're talking about a fundamental way of managing an organization so it can improve as an organization, which is not the same as an ISO 9000 implementation plan for conversions from 2009 to 2015. It's a different conversation. If we have the lower conversation, of course, we don't get into the executive suite. But if we have a higher conversation saying, how do we improve our competitiveness? It's not by using net promoter score, okay? It's not by ignoring the sevens and eights. Y'all know what net promoter score is? 10 point scale on a single question, will you recommend? We subtract the nines and tens, from that we subtract one through six, and that's net promoter score. So if you scored a seven or eight, I'm sorry, you're not our customer, you don't count, I don't care what you feel. But I care, are they going down or are they going up? I know, oh, by the way, there's no connectivity. I never track you as an individual customer. So you got the net promoter score this month. Next quarter, I'm gonna ask somebody else and ignore you. So there's no longevity. It has no predictive value. And yet, almost every major organization is using it now because just like the Harvard blessed balanced scorecard, it's promoted mindlessly. And we as a quality community should go back and challenge those things because the calculations are wrong. They're in error. And there is no documented study from Bain Corporation or Harvard that justifies that those scores have ever improved the quality of sales of an organization. And none of the critiques of that net promoter score 
founded by academics, have ever been refuted. They've been ignored. So it's not science. So we want to promote quality sciences in the future. And what we start seeing is if we want to do this, we're going to go to war. And we talk about war with three different levels of operating a war. I was a lieutenant commander in the Navy, went to war college and those things. So we learn about grand strategy. What's grand strategy? It's working with the political people to buy weapon systems. Okay, so that's about resourcing. Operational art in military warfare is about how you're going to deploy your troops in the field. So I'm going to put this battalion over there, this one over here, this capability, we'll have airplanes here and so forth. But when we talk about tactical operations, it's how am I going to achieve this particular objective on the battlefield and it's decided by the sergeant or the supervisor based on the resources he has at hand. And so as we look at those things, when we're talking about quality strategy, it's embedded in the tactical operations. It's down here. And when we talk about quality as strategy, it's operational art. How are we going to deploy to an advantage the resources we've invested in to become better than the competition? Or what resources do we need to acquire that will allow us to have that advantage? So do we use machine learning? Is that one of the things that's going to take us there in the future? Will artificial intelligence help? I remember giving my first brief to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy about artificial intelligence. He was an Irish man. And he said, Commander Watson, why do I want to invest in this artificial intelligence when there's not enough of the real thing around? And I had no answer for him. And I think that's part of the problem. You have to be able to model something in those processes. It's not just investing in those things. I was at a company last week talking to them, and, and they had created an IT system that adds an overlay on top of SAP so they can get processes coming out. They can then map the sequence of events into processes. And they were so pleased with themselves. And I said, oh, well, how do you know if any of those processes was done right? Oh, they just spent 20 million on that. Mouri, Mouri, okay. So the job of leadership is to inspire change, and that's what we, we saw when we were talking about Yoshio Kondo. And so if we're going to inspire change, then we have to persuade individual workers that they need to contribute. And so we have to be able to do something that helps those workers understand it's a win-win. It's something that gives them something as well as the organization something. And so if we're going to engineer a competitive business system, we have to take a look at both this product side and this process side. And we have to wrap it around the customer. And that's exactly what Toyota did with the design system, the production system, the sales system. And yeah, that's what the new Toyota logo should mean. Ooh, wasn't that cute? You see the, they didn't see that coming, did you? And neither did Toyota. Because you know what Toyota talks about their logo? They say, oh, this forms a T in this background, and in here is sort of the resources we use. And then they say, oh, it's a desk guy. They like that. So they say, it's yours, it's a present. So, but this is, is the thing, is you start pulling the organization, you get, there's a lot of things happening in that organization to make it work. So these things are this integrated system. So we have this quality principles, we have the business system, we have cross-functional management. And Hoshin Tenkai, this was that X matrix, it's the deployment down into the organization to embrace the daily management system of what all that strategy means. That's how the X matrix is actually used in Japan. It's called Hoshin Tenkai, the rollout of the strategy. It's not about the choosing of all of this up here. That's in the piece that Japan just doesn't talk about. That's called strategic management by policy. Uh, fortunately, I'll talk about it. So we see that there's two types of Gemba. There's this Gemba 1, and then there's this Gemba 2. And in Gemba 2, it's like the plan and check, the reflective functions of plan, do, check, act. Gemba 1 is like the do and act functions. And what we want to see is collaboration between the whole system. You can't get plan, do, check, act if you're going to break it up like this. It has to flow together. And so we have this idea of catchball. This was the original diagram that came out of catchball when it was created in 1979 by Kenzo Satsuoka. 
Kenzel Satsuoka was the president of Yokogawa Hewlett Packard. I said every Deming company has to contribute something that advances quality, and that was what happened with this catch ball process. And notice what happens. We have ideas you know, that are being generated up here, and then they get formulated, they become projects, projects get done, and they get implemented. And over time, the whole organization gets involved in this process. This is another way of looking at this catch ball process. It's about negotiation. The Japanese word is suriyawashi. And suriyawashi means the sharpening of a sword. And so when you sharpen a sword, you've got metal, and you've got stone, and you've got some lubricating oil. And then you've got a template, so you measure, am I getting the blade's spa space absolutely correct? And all of those three happen because we're actually moving this system back and forth in a negotiation process. Now, when we talk about strategic quality, this is the book, it's in Japanese, okay? And it was written by one of our colleagues in the International Academy, Hir Hiroshi Osada. Uh, he and I are both called the quality babies in Japan along with uh, uh, Itsuka-san, because when we were 50s, I, I suggested him for the International Academy for Quality, and Dr. Kondo says, no, no, he's a baby. And so, because I was 50 also, the three of us became the quality babies. But this is, is the process that was actually created and promoted in 1991 in the first book on Hoshin Kanri by Yoji Kao called Hoshin Kanri. It was a study that was done for, from 1963 to 1989, funded by the Japanese Statistical Association, on how does strategic quality work. That became the 2003 standard for Hoshin Kanri, which is in, translated into English, and now there's a 2013 standard for that, which is translated into English. And if you really want to understand Japanese quality, go buy it, it's less than 20 euros, and it's on the website, Japanese Society for Quality Control Standards in English. Okay, and you can see exactly what they do. And this front end here is the strategic part. And there are strategic tools. In 1997, Michael Porter of the five forces saying, the Japanese don't do strategy. They only do tactics. And two years before that, here are the S7 tools that they actually apply in that front end. So they do environmental analysis, product analysis, market analysis, product to market analysis, portfolio analysis, strategic element analysis, resource allocation analysis. Excuse me, that's probably more than most of the big fortune companies do in their strategy process. And what it is is Michael Porter not understanding what the Japanese actually do when it comes to strategy. So as we look at these things, we start seeing that as we're talking about this, Osada has made the comment that at the front end, what's not done well is this idea of strategy formulation. So here's a strategy formulation process. Jisu Kanri is self-management, it's at the base. Hinchitsu Kanri is the checking function of daily management and Kaizen Kanri and this to make sure that it gets into this process properly. But fundamental to everything, is Jisoo Kanri, self-control. And Hoshin Kanri is about setting up the strategy, but that goes into Kinabetsu Kanri, which is the cross-functional management system. And so Hoshin Kanri is not what most of these people who've written books about it have said it is. It's a much more complex cross-functional organization management system than we would view from most of those simplified assumptions. And so what I'm, I'm just going to challenge you is there's a lot of thesis topics there, students who are interested, in terms of how does this actually get done, how can it be applied in different organizations and around the world. So JKK, I mentioned this, this is this process of ownership. It's still in development. So ownership for cross-functional flows, ownership for management resource allocation, both of those are being done. And when we look at the system, what we start seeing is individual projects and those could be black belt and green belt projects, create a program project, and that's like the Hoshin, and multiple of those create organizational change. And the master black belt role in much of this is how do I actually affect the organizational change over a period of time? And one of the things we see is, yes, the Japanese accept there is some dip in here from performance based on the time it takes to integrate this system but they recognize also, over the long run, our performance will go up much higher. And so, one thing management does is they make sure we allocate the resources properly. 
So one thing is, if management says we're going to do something, what happens? It's easy for them to say. They'll deploy it down to a committee, and then it engages the workers at the workforce. So let's say let, we're going to do SAP. Okay, easy for the management to say. We get some committees, and the workers have to figure out what's the master data, how are the processes operated. You've done SAP. Next thing we know is management says, oops, our measurement system doesn't work. Easy for them to say, get a committee together, ask the quality manager to facilitate it. And now we have to gauge a committee to figure out how we do the measurement system. ISO 9000 2015 just came out. How do we get compliance? And the next thing we know is we have to start it all over again because now we're not losing money. And what happens? All of the mandatory work the daily management system was doing got pushed out by the mandates of leadership. The most important thing to manage in the organization is the resource allocation for change improvement because many organizations will do exactly this and then they get this working function so that they're burned out and they can't actually do the work. They're working so hard that they have to do something. I got five minutes. Well, that's actually a lot of time for me. Okay, so what's important? Standard work and then uh, continual improvement and strategic work. All three have to be done in the organization. And if we're talking about work as movement, what we really want is to move the organization forward in all three of those dimensions. And how do we regulate the daily management system? We do that by bringing this forward, and so we have operating efficiency in terms of this organization. We have to have alerts to external changes. We can automate that in a BI system. We can get situational awareness by our big data systems, and they help us externally. Internally, we have to translate the big data view into the microcosm of the daily management process. And that's best done through project team work. It's not done by big data analytics. Okay, we have to get through and do things. We have to understand the seven flows in the Japanese system. So there's not just one type of flow, material flow. We can have asset flow, logic flow, human error flow, authoritative flow, decision rights. And there is no 5S system in Japan Toyota has 10 S's. 5S for workers, you can't move from sort, systematize, sanitize to standardize because you haven't done these middle steps. But the workers alone are not responsible for them. That's a critical ingredient. The whole thing works as a system. If you think 5S for workers is the answer, you're wrong. You don't sustain the system. I have to work with production controllers. I have to work with uh, people who are doing testing and, the, and the, the management system who's going to control the flow. The workers don't control the flow. I have to have maintenance people to build the mistake proofing devices and so forth. And so in a daily management system, it's not just the housekeeping of the worker, it's the integration of the whole thing, which I call a 10S system. You go for the seven zeros in a daily management system. And in production, zero defects, zero excess waste, uh, zero lot sizes, zero setups, and so forth. All of those are the things you work for because you're working for perfection in that system. And when we take a look at this, Toyota does continual improvement, Kaizen, because all changes made to the documented work processes, changes are proposed by workers, experiments supervisor-led, change processes are tested using the scientific method, experiments that improve performance become standard work, and lowly standards, according to Taiichi Ono, control the process performance system. So doing the right things right the first time, every time, is what the Toyota management system is all about. So if we learn to see differently, and that's what the Toyota systems, we can act decisively. So we want to facilitate the next generation of innovation and apply that into our work. So thank you very much.